in regarding the in the past eight days regarding the complete absolute just in a lot of ways uh, so political and social overhaul in so many ways as a result of this uh, Charlottesville rally and all of the dangerous consequences that are coming out of it for freedom of speech, more domestic chaos um, with a lot of various factions getting riled up and things are getting more and more heated on a lot of fronts and just all of the circumstances behind the event in Charlottesville, the uh, the Trump response and the response of the media and of, and of the people in general, as well as uh, the the event just two days ago, which could be seen as a uh, as a direct response to Charlottesville, although I think there's a lot more to it that I'm going to get into. And that's Steve Bannon being fired as the or being removed, whatever you, however you want to put it, as the uh, as Donald Trump's chief strategist, playing the role of uh, Karl Rove to Donald Trump's George W. Bush. So um, unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to record. Uh, Jeremy's been uh, Jeremy's had business going on. He hasn't had a. Ch- time to uh, set up a recording with me and I uh, and I haven't had a great opportunity in the past week or so to actually sit down and get a get a podcast recorded and uploaded so I'm just now getting a chance to do this so I'm going to give my perspective on some of the events going on with uh with Charlottesville some of the factors that I think are important as well as with the uh, Steve Bannon leaving the administration and going back to Breitbart where he is promised to declare war on the Trump administration. That's what uh, the headlines coming out. Steve Bannon is plotting with Robert Mercer, who's, I guess, his financial money man, the money bags behind uh, Breitbart and a lot of the other uh, of the new right network that is uh, that is evolving, that is coming into fruition now. And they're planning war. That's what the headlines say. Bannon and Mercer were together for five hours planning war in New York City. And uh, even the... One of the editors of Breitbart, <clears throat> excuse me, Joel Pollack, posted, tweeted that hashtag war. So clearly there's some major things going on here. And I don't think that everything is what it seems. I'm going to try and uh, clear up what I believe are some misconceptions about Steve Bannon and what he represents and what the actual significance of him leaving the administration is. And I know I've talked a lot about this before, so people probably have an idea of where I'm going with it. But I hope you find the analysis that I put out about this as well as uh, – as well as Charlottesville, to be very interesting. So, uh, so here we go. With regards to Charlottesville, um, obviously it's just this is a shine of just how one major event can just completely transform things. And uh, and it's been eight days, and we've already seen a lot of ramifications coming out of this with uh, with with regards to free speech, with regards to the political climate, and uh, I think that this is just the beginning. I mean, this is the very beginning of what I think is going to be a long-lasting series of consequences to come out of that rally. With the benefit of hindsight, it's really interesting to look back and see the people who were involved in the rally and that these people all had primary roles, with the exception of this Jason Kessler. I'm not sure exactly what his role is within, like, the alt-right, but this guy was, by all accounts, was an ex-Hillary Clinton supporter, an Occupy Wall Street organizer, and now he's organizing... uh, Organizing restore or uh, unite the right rallies, which are out to uh, to eliminate Jewish influence from America. It's just it's 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 amazing how that works. But as far as a lot of the other organizers, we have a much more clear uh, a clear I think understanding of what they represent, who they are, and what they represent. Those would include people like um, websites such as the Daily Stormer, which were promoting this event for at least a month before the uh, before it actually took place. Uh, Someone like uh, David Duke, of course, we've got into him, kind of the grand poobah, the the uh, the elder, the great elder of the alt right, and uh, in his connections over the years, the things he's been involved with, he played a primary role in this event, including giving the media the ammunition needed to tie this event to Donald Trump and his supporters, which was his statement just before the rally that uh, we are we are fulfilling Donald Trump's campaign promises. So, and uh, Richard Spencer is another one, of course. Richard Spencer has. Uh, Complete media creation, product of the uh, regnery, uh, conservative book publishing dynasty. And these were the faces behind this movie. You could also look at someone like uh, Matthew Heimbach, who I don't honestly have as much uh, knowledge or information about. I don't know as much about him as I do some of the others. But there are there have been things that have come out which have uh, been seriously uh, questioning what he's all about and what his, uh, his motives are in this alt-right movement. So, And... We've, uh, Jeremy and I have done shows talking about the, um, talking about the radicalization of many elements of the right 
not just before, before, not just since Trump got elected. I mean, this is something that's been going on for a while now. I mean, you look at the Tea Party and the rise of the Tea Party during Obama, the early years of the o Obama administration. That was an example of what is becoming the increasing radicalization of the right wing in America as a result of uh, a lot of the changing economic and uh, political fortunes and social social climate in this country. And, uh, and we've talked about how this has been, in a lot of ways, we believe the Tea Party was the precursor for Donald Trump. The same same parties were involved in a lot of ways, the same same people behind the scenes that were creating the propaganda for the Tea Party, people such as Steve Bannon and the and the late Andrew Breitbart, uh, people like that, and how this really does appear to have paved the way for Donald Trump. It's almost like the Tea Party was a testing ground for Trump, and we've seen this increased radicalization of the right over the past, I don't know, I'd say about eight, nine, ten years or so, and it's really coming into fruition now with uh, in the age of Donald Trump as president. And so we talked about how um, just after the election, you started having the, uh, the – there was the controversy. With, I think it was about a month after Trump got elected with uh, Milo Yiannopoulos going to UC Berkeley. And um, it, of course, caused a big uproar, caused a lot of chaos, a lot of uh, violence in Berkeley when that happened, violent protests. And Trump even tweeting that he was thinking – considering uh, removing the, uh, you know, the, the, the financial uh, protection and the – funding that goes to public universities, and uh, we picked up on a comment that Milo made where he was talking about in the future he might have, I think it was on the Alex Jones show, where he might have uh, federal agents accompany him, or uh, Fed, Secret Service type, uh, National Guard types accompany him to college campuses in the future to protect him from hecklers and from people who are opposed to free speech. That's Milo's words. And so we, uh, we've identified these uh, attempts by someone like Milo Yiannopoulos, and then the later protests in a uh, Berkeley and Coulter went out there, or at least was scheduled to go out there. I don't remember if she actually spoke there or not. And there was a big uproar of people threatening to, promising to shut her speech down. Then there were the borderline riots, actually, in, uh, in Berkeley in April, where another one of the people who was a big part of this Unite the Right rally, Nathan Damago, was caught on camera punching a, punching a Antifa protester in the face. And so uh, that whole thing. And to me, it what we got out of this is that this appears to be, in some ways, a, a coordinated effort by elements within the right, within Trump's harder right support base, both on the so-called alt-right and the so-called alt-light, to basically create uh, disturbances and to create a disturbance knowing it would get the, the set up events, knowing how people would react, knowing that there would probably be likely be paid provocateurs who would go in there and challenge their rallies or their events and whatnot, and then you could have the you could have the recipe created for a situation where the federal government has to take action, and therefore, if the I think that what I think people like Milo may have been going for, and I don't, this is perhaps what these alt right protesters are going for as well, uh, that were in Charlottesville that that promised to be other places here later this year, and I'm sure this is not the last we've heard of these protests because now the uh, the efforts to bring down the Confederate flags is in complete full, or not just Confederate flags, excuse me, Confederate monuments, Confederate uh, anything that is symbolic of the Confederacy is to the effort to, uh, to tear those, uh, to tear those, tear all of that down and basically remove it from our history is in full swing right now. But I think I get the impression that this is uh, perhaps designed to. That this is all a, an attempt to um, pave the way for the Trump administration with the Attorney General Jeff, Jeff Sessions, who I referred to as, a, as John Ashcroft on steroids, um, to really crack down and stifle, stifle dissent and in in free speech in a lot of ways on college campuses. And then we could go even further into that and how a lot of the Trump people, a lot of the right-wingers who are for Trump, who are... Um, Big time Zionist pro Israel fanatics, they're all worried about the, the, oh, the BDS people have free speech on campuses and this is dangerous. So this could perhaps fit into all of this too. You see a bigger puzzle forming with the, um, with this and whether, and I think that's a major point to take into consideration if we ask ourselves whether or not this is an attempt to really, uh, create situations where you could create the desired response and with the knowledge that the usual suspects on the other side, are going to react accordingly and send in 
paid counter protesters to uh, to contribute to any sort of chaos that takes place. And there you have an excuse for the presidency to sh crack down on a lot of the uh, on a lot of dissent that goes outside of the uh, mainstream uh, narrative that has been put out there for us. So I, I don't know if this is the case or not, but this is kind of the this is the impression that I get from the recent uh, chaos in Charlottesville and just all of the changes that have taken place since then. It really seems we're on the fast track. For something big, I don't know what that is. I don't want to sound like I'm fear mongering, but it definitely appears that we're on the, uh, the cusp of some big things here, and not just necessarily in the next day or week or month, but over the next couple of years. So look out for that. Um, but it's it's very interesting how it's always the same. It always seems to be the same people who are um, in these uh, pro who who are in these protests, whether they're organizing the protests or they're um, or they're setting up the protests, or they're out there as the public mouthpiece for the protests. It's funny how it's always the same people who are in the front lines, who manage to get the cameras on them, who manage to get the media publicity, every single time. It's when you you look at the alt-light, it's always the same people. It's Alex Jones and Paul Joseph Watson and Mike Cernovich, and increasingly someone like a... Uh, a Jack Posobiec with his background in naval intelligence, as even NBC News has documented, or um, Tommy Robinson over in Europe, in the UK. And with the alt-right, it's the same thing. It's David Duke, it's Richard Spencer, it's Andrew Anglin, it's increasingly becoming someone like Matthew Heimbach. It's the, it's the same people that are out there putting out the message that the media jumps on and... Charlottesville is no exception. It's all the same people getting all the coverage, and I don't believe that's by accident. And I believe that uh, this is really being done to uh, aid to actually help advance the Trump narrative as well as the Zionist agenda via the via the right hand, right arm of Zionism, the far right arm of Zionism. And some people will say, "Well, that sounds odd." I mean, you look at look at these people on the alt right. I mean, they just hate Jews. They just all they do is badmouth Jews and talk about how evil Jews are, well, you know, that's not, I won't, I won't argue with that, but are they actually providing any substance when they do that? Are they actually giving the real perspective on Zionism and, uh, and elements of uh, Jewish and Zionist power that really need to be analyzed? Are they really doing that in an effective way? Are they effectively analyzing the realities of false flag terrorism and the realities of how the actual deep state works with uh, all of the all the intrigue that goes on in so many different circles through all political movements and the proven documentation the documented proof of uh, co-opting and controlling uh, political and social opposition movements are they bringing attention to this stuff or are they just putting out random uh, just memes and gifs and uh, narratives about Jews as evil hook nosed evil evil uh, threats to humanity and who just want to just uh, wreak havoc and hurt hurt everybody? Are they? Is that what they're doing? I mean, are they actually putting out substantive criticism of Zionism and uh, elements of Jewish power that are not that we're not allowed to criticize in society? Which really, without being uh, put, without facing any type of punishment, you go ask Jonathan Azaziah, who uh, who by the way didn't get even didn't get any media attention outside of local articles in Toronto where he was uh, where he was at at the time as he went uh, on the run from uh, from Canadian authorities for his uh, for his music lyrics didn't get any of the media attention ask Jonathan as a or ask Professor Tony Hall who outside of being smeared in the local press in the community where he'd been a professor for the past 26 years in Lethbridge Ontario I mean excuse me Lethbridge Alberta received next to no media coverage anywhere and lost his tenureship over his uh, over his refusal to uh, over his uh, you know over having basic questions about events which happened over 70 years ago. And I don't care how you feel about the Holocaust or how you feel about anything related to Germany and World War II and all that. The idea that somebody could lose their livelihood for for questioning, asking questions about something that happened over 70 years ago, is absolutely preposterous. It, Borderline, it's absolute nonsense. But Tony Hall didn't get the media coverage that that um, 
that these people are getting. And in a lot of ways, their criticism, I think, is much more effective than what we're seeing from the likes of Duke and Spencer and Anglin and all these others. So you have to ask yourself, are they actually critis- Are they actually providing analysis that is actually critical enough to really um, – create a uh, actual productive dialogue, or are they just acting in a way that fulfills all the worst stereotypes of anyone who questions, who questions Israel, questions Zionism, questions uh, disproportionate uh, roles of prominent Zionists, prominent uh, Jewish Zionists in various in different areas of, uh, of influence, such as banking, finance, government, uh, media, are they are they just doing this in a way that makes anyone who questions this stuff look like a complete uh, just look like the absolute stereotype that the that the media and organizations such as the Anti Defamation League want critics of Israel and Zionism and elements of Jewish power to look like? That's the question we've got to ask. And with this Unite the Right rally, what did it accomplish? I mean, you had David Duke go out and say this is the fulfillment of Donald Trump's campaign promise. You had the Daily Stormer with its uh, technical whatever whatever role he plays, the the former hacker who was buddy with a bunch of prominent uh, progressives like Glenn Greenwald. I use the term progressive in quotations. Um, the been pa- palling around with them in the past. The, the former hacker. Obvious said weave putting out articles for the Daily Stormer that the girl who the woman who was killed in the uh, car act in the when the car rammed into the crowd was a fat childless slut who contributed nothing to humanity. We should go and protest like the uh, Westboro Baptist Church protests uh, funerals. I mean, who is that benefiting? Uh, that doesn't benefit anybody. That doesn't create any sort of productive dialogue. Certainly doesn't create a productive dialogue in the the way that some people like Jeremy and myself are trying to create a productive dialogue, or, or various others. Um, Kevin Barrett and Tony Hall, I think there's some, you know, I, they're, they're not perfect in the way they address this stuff, but they certainly are coming at it from a much more productive uh, manner than these alt-right people are. I mean, particularly Tony Hall, I mean, lost his livelihood over his, over his uh, opinions about, or actually just asking basic questions and not accepting with 110% uh, factual uh, a narrative of an event that happened over 70 years ago. So so to me, it's no accident that these people are in the forefront of the protests and of the, um, of the, of the media narrative of the events in Charlottesville. It's no accident. It's, it's no mistake. And... Once again, you see the same connections popping up with these people. Of course, David Duke with his uh, history of media spotlight of saying things with regards to Donald with regards to Donald Trump that is uh, that always manages to seem to uh, be the perfect ammunition for the media to tie anything that the alt right does to Donald Trump. And of course, Richard Spencer and his uh, constant media presence. He's become a national celebrity in a lot of ways over the last year or so. And the Daily Stormer being at the forefront of this rally. And so I think we've definitely had a coordinated event here. And it's interesting, the, the symbolism of the Confederate monuments and of the symbolism of the uh, monuments dedicated to people like Robert E. Lee, who most Americans, even if you're not um, sympathetic to the Confederacy or you don't have any sort of like a loyalty to anything Southern or related to the Confederacy, uh, most Americans consider to be one of their great heroes in their history. And the, symbol, the symbolism behind this is very powerful because not, even people who don't have any strong opinions about the Confederacy and the South and the Civil War in general are going to express outrage over what they feel is their history, their heritage, their country's history being erased by, with, symbolically by having these monuments removed. So it's the perfect storm to create a... Uh, to create a chaotic situation that's going to cause an emotional reaction. Um, and so I think that these people knew what they were doing by organizing this rally. They knew what they were doing with, uh, with bringing all this attention to this rally, telling their people to show up in Charlottesville. I think they knew that there was going to be a police stand down. They knew that there was going to be uh, people coming in from the other side that could come in and uh, with some elements paid to create problems come in and just uh, and just cause trouble and set up all kinds of uh, 
set up all kinds of problems which will lead to a, a reaction like the sort that we've gotten. And my issue with the Confederate monuments is this. I don't really have a strong opinion one way or the other about the Confederate monuments, about the monuments dedicated to Robert E. Lee, to Stonewall Jackson, to people like that. Um, I can understand. I don't... Um, um, I don't know what's going to happen with those. I can understand the strong feelings people on both sides of that have regarding the monuments and their uh, and what they what they represent. I kind of uh, stay out of like taking a definitive stance in that debate um, for one thing. Um, I don't see the Ro I don't see the Albert Pike statue getting the same kind of scrutiny that the Robert E. Lee statues are getting, that the Stonewall Jackson statues are getting. Or even the George Washington statues, for that matter. Um, some people are talking about we need to remove George Washington's name off certain things because he was a slaveholder. Thomas Jefferson. I don't see the. Uh, I don't. I don't exactly see the Albert Pike monument getting the same attention. The the Albert Pike statue with the um, I believe it's one of the Masonic sites in D.C. Of course, Albert Pike, if you know anything about him, um, was a high-ranking Freemason, former Confederate, and I believe he was affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan wrote about three world wars and how there would be not just two world wars but three world wars and how basically telling how Christianity and Islam would be pitted against each other, the major world religions. So I was a bit surprised to see that there were some council members in D.C. who called for the Albert Pike Monument to be removed. It would be interesting to see if that goes anywhere. But in general, with the, with the removal of the monuments and it's a perfect issue to get people on all on all sides riled up and very passionate about. Because in the aftermath of uh, Charlottesville, you create a, create a reaction on one side that, oh, these people are just, you know, this rally is horrible. It's the, it's, uh, it's the manifestation, the epitome of racism in America, and these evil people are sympathetic to the South, and they're sympathetic to these slaveholders, and they're... So we must bring the statues down. We must bring their symbolic heroes down. It's all white supremacy. Then you get the other side saying, no, this is our history, this is our heritage. You're tearing it down. You're trying to destroy our country from within by bringing down our monuments, by bringing down our, uh, by erasing our history. And I may not agree with these people, but you better keep your hands off of our monuments. You better keep your hands off of our history or else you're going to have some trouble on your hands. Those are the narratives that I see building here. And it's a perfect issue to get people riled up with. And once again, these people who are getting all of this attention raised to these Confederate monuments, which honestly, in the grand scheme of things, as far as actually the uh, what happens to the country as far as uh, politically, these Confederate monuments are honestly a non-factor. I'll tell you what is a factor. A factor is Donald Trump aligning himself with right-wing Zionists, hard right-wing Zionists, represented by the Breitbart crowd, represented by um, some of the hardliners that he has in, uh, over in Israel, serving in positions like ambassador. And, of course, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is the uh, over there trying to make peace and over there meet in high-level meetings with Netanyahu and the Israeli government. And, of course, this goes all the way back to Roy Cohn and then to uh, what appears to be actual, you use the term, uh, you call the Russian media scandal about Russian election hacking and how the Russians stole our democracy when you really look at Donald Trump's Russian connections and they appear to be Israeli connections via high-ranking mob figures in Russia that are also apparently have close ties to Vladimir Putin. And it creates, you know, much bit different picture of that. But that's the kind of thing that affects our, that is going to have a direct effect on the immediate future of our country and long-term future of our country. As much as the Confederate monuments are a symbolic reference for a lot of, a lot of people, for, uh, as far as the patriotism and the history of their country is concerned, bringing down the monuments is not going to affect the near or long-term uh, situation in this country. What is is continually running cover for a president who has proven himself in every way, shape, and form to be a to be a full blown hardcore Zionist, pro Israel, one hundred percent, regardless of what noise is made along the way, or regardless of what type of a uh, what type of Cambridge Analytica inspired uh, questionable controversies come up about Trump's uh, 
um, various things he says or various things other people in his administration say or alleged insensitivity to Jews and Zionism or just the Jews in general and Sebastian Gorka having alleged Nazi ties when in reality Sebastian Gorka is uh, doing more than most people to push forth the Israeli agenda with uh, advancing the clash of civilizations narrative with Islam as the, as the real evil in the world and we got to call out Islam by its name and not just kill terrorists but we got to we got to target Islam in general. Uh, it's clearly documented what the Trump administration represents and what the media outlets and the the elements within the within the uh, within the elite circles that got Donald Trump elected that that made it possible for him to become president. It's obvious what they represent. Yet these people, instead of you know the the professed the uh, the supposed purported anti-Zionists who are supposed to be the ones who are fighting Zionism, who are fighting against Israel and Jewish power, they're instead still apologizing for Trump. They use the term they're cucking for Donald Trump while they continue to continue to make a huge deal out of these monuments and then they and then they'll and they'll go out with their hook nose memes and uh, the greedy Jew with the big nose and the just wanting his hands and all the money and stuff and wanting power and the evil George Soros memes and the the Holocaust memes that the stupid Daily Stormer likes to put out, and they'll they'll do their three parentheses with their echo chamber, and they'll put they give the impression that they're fighting the power. Meanwhile, they're protecting, uh, the, I would say probably the real most hardcore, the real uh, the most hardcore elements of the Israeli uh, of the Israeli the Israeli agenda both in the West and globally via defending Donald Trump and the outlets uh, that created him, such as Breitbart and, uh, and a person like a Steve Bannon. So you get people riled up about the Confederate monument, that creates the emotional reaction, but what it also does is it gets the desired response out of people and it creates a paradigm where they're, where it's just going to be a permanent state of divide and conquer while we're not getting any answers about the real issues that are going on that are the most that are the most consequential. I mean that's just what's what's happening here. And on the flip side you've got the the other side of the narrative and the how the media is is inciting this. And it's not just the liberal media. It's not just CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post and MSNBC that are in Hollywood that are um, that are shaping the narrative of this. No, it's the right wing media as well. And it's and it's even Donald Trump himself and the all of the narrative that we've seen from this, as I said, is just designed to create and to perpetuate this divide and conquer agenda where people are at each other's throats and you can't agree on anything. You can't even have political conversations in public in a lot of ways. You can't even have like a public expression of a of political views for the me uh you know, hence you offend someone or or whatever, and and this is perpetuating it that much further. And on the flip side of what the right is doing by getting these people so riled up about the about the Confederate monuments to the point to where they're not telling the truth about Donald Trump and how and what Donald Trump represents with regards to a right wing Zionist agenda with under the facade of nationalism and memes such as make America great again, the left is doing the same thing. The quote left. I mean there are real leftists out there, people like uh people like Scott Creighton who runs the uh Willie Loman blog, uh WillieLoman.wordpress.com. There's an example of a true of a true leftist progressive. Um and there are many others as well. There are many, many others out there. And I'm not trying to paint all people who go to protest on either side as being bad people, but there clearly are the bad apples that are thrown in there and there's a good chance the ones who are causing problems at these rallies have been likely been paid to do so. But there are many, many good people out there who are who are true manifestations, true representations of what like a principled right and a principled left would look like. Jeremy and I, we talk about the the um the the radical middle and embracing the radical middle. That's the phrase that Jeremy coined. But we're not going to get that with this current media narrative. And what is the left doing? Left is getting all riled up about racism and um, and Confederate monuments and all this. Meanwhile, left is taking its eyes off of the ball. And where 
it must be where the important factor is not the Confederate monuments. It's not what this or this person in the Trump administration says that is designed to create a uh, to create an exaggerated reaction. No, the, what the I think what I think a lot of people on the left need to be worried about is the continued the continued power plays and the attempts the propaganda efforts to put in another neoliberal uh, just another neoliberal Wall Street beholden. Uh, Puppet as a in, in a position of power once once uh, Donald Trump is no longer there. That's what needs to be worried about. And instead of instead of telling the truth that all this is manufactured psyop in many ways, designed to divide and conquer the population, create domestic chaos, and perhaps to usher in um, serious uh, by, um, serious stifling of freedom of speech, stifling of all of the. Uh, of the freedoms that we hold most dear, they're instead painting this as being all about white supremacy and racism and the Confederate flags are evil or the Confederate monuments are evil and uh, focus on Russia, 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 Russia. And of course, as Jeremy and I have documented, there is something with Russia. It's not the way that the establishment left is portraying it. So it's very unfortunate to see the good people on all these sides get caught up in this stuff. And... Also, I don't want to get involved in comparing Antifa to the alt-right. I don't want to get involved in those comparisons. But, I mean, you're getting a lot of people on the, quote, left who are defending the Antifas, Antifas as a, uh, as a, as a much-needed counterweight against the influence of the alt-right. But, I mean, is that really true? Because we've got, there is evidence. We've seen this, and a lot of people on the left just don't want to acknowledge these facts. That we've had documented events of provocateurs being put into events to create chaos and to vilify and demonize leftists, much like I think a lot of these right-wingers, these far hard-right people are doing this to discredit the, the actual, any good type of uh, resistance that goes on within the right and any type of principled... Uh, principal opposition to the uh, to business as usual to this uh, false paradigm that we find ourselves living in. So, yeah, and unfortunately, this is going to be used to sell another neoliberal false hope to the uh, to the left base. Someone like a like a Kamala Harris is a good possibility for that. And there may be other ones out there in the uh, in the woodworks that are that we don't know about yet. Um, there could be another Barack Obama out there who didn't come along until George W. Bush's re-election as a, as a national celebrity. So. so you never know with that, but I definitely believe that this is going to be used by the left to put out another progressive false hope, and that's not the solution we need. But unfortunately, when you create emotional responses that cause people to... You create emotion to people, and you put out these events that cause people to react emotionally rather than logically, you're going to have this problem, and therefore we're not, it's going to be more and more difficult to have the conversations that need to be had about this kind of stuff. So in conclusion, my, uh, my, my belief on Charlottesville is that this has been a largely manufactured event with agents and uh, people that are likely on the, uh, working with the federal government in some capacity or with the, you know, the FBI or the CIA in some capacity are are out there, set up this event, organized it, promoted it, and then people were sent in on the other side to um, to create the desired reaction. And it's important that we don't get caught up into this because, but unfortunately, far too many of us are. I almost got caught up into this because I almost actually came close. I confess this. I came close. You know, I came somewhat close to actually voting for Donald Trump simply because of the way the media was painting the Trump versus Clinton narrative and how Clinton, and I just believed that Clinton was so bad that we just couldn't, you know, we had to vote for the alternative to uh, avoid Clinton. But, you know, I did, thankfully, and I don't regret this for one second, I ended up voting for the Green Party and Jill Stein in when I actually got into the voting booth. So I don't regret not voting for Trump. But there were times when I was very much into this uh, into this idea that, it is, we've got to, that the narrative that's being shaped for us in some ways is actually an honest one. 
although I've never trusted the media, I actually did almost buy into the idea of Trump as an actual, like, hope is in terms of being a counter to Clinton, but far too many of us are, of our people are accepting this, and a lot of people who should know better, who are very smart, who do have a lot a big under, bigger understanding of how a lot of this works, are still falling into these traps, and I think a lot of that is based on emotional responses. And I like the tweet that I saw from somebody uh, this past weekend uh, in Charlottesville. There are more, more feds Feds, on, feds in Charlottesville right now than a typical work day at Langley. I think that described it perfectly. But unfortunately, they're the ones who people are listening to that are getting the emotional reactions out, that are causing people to think emotionally and react in what I believe is the wrong manner to all of this. So that's the big thing coming out of Charlottesville is it's going to be very important to not allow these psyops, these manufactured events to dictate how we feel about what's going on and to dictate our responses to things. Now, the other big news of the past week, the past eight days since we went on air, or since Charlottesville, excuse me, um, was the was Steve Bannon resigning, being removed, being fired, whatever you want to call it, from White House as Donald Trump's chief strategist. And with the benefit of hindsight, this is something that I should have seen coming, but for some reason I had this feeling that Bannon wasn't going to be removed from the administration because he was too important. And with the benefit of hindsight, that's a, that was a mistaken belief for me to have, and it was kind of a foolish one to have. And I'll explain why. Because I believed that Bannon, along with Jared Kushner, were too, uh, in some ways, were indispensable to this administration in terms of being there and being in there. But now it's very obvious that Steve Bannon is going to have a much more influential role over Donald Trump and over his base back at Breitbart than he ever could is within the administration with all the other people around. So um, I, I'm, I'm amazed and shocked, and in some ways I'm ashamed that I didn't see this trend coming. But yes, uh, Steve Bannon is out of the White House, and it makes a lot of people happy and also makes a lot of people very sad. I'm going to go into what I think are the consequences of this. Um, with, in my view on Steve Bannon, Jeremy and I have talked about this on a number of occasions, is that Steve Bannon does not, and Breitbart do not, repre do not represent actual... American populism, actual American grassroots patriotism, anything but. In reality, what I believe Steve Bannon and Breitbart represent is a voice, the number one probably in, most influential media platform for not just the right wing, but the far right. And when I say far right, I mean talk about the far right domestically here in America who take a hardline stance on issues like immigration, on issues like trade, and on, uh, on national security, you could call it a hard line, although if you really took a hard line on national security, you'd be exposing a lot of these, uh, the false paradigm of this war on terrorism, which is created in a lot of ways by staged, staged and manufactured terrorism events. But this is what passes as the hard line, is people like Sebastian Gorka. But also, not only do they take a hard line domestically, but they also take a hard line when it comes to issues related to Israel's domestic politics, such as the desire of the right wing in Israel to build unlimited settlements on Palestinian land, and the desire of the right wing in Israel to move the American embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which I think would cause all hell to break loose in the Middle East. And even the desire of the right in Israel to... Just get us out of this Iran deal, and um, because because of a paranoia that has been put out there about Iran's imminent nuclear program, when in reality it's just the same things Netanyahu's been saying for for over 30 years about Iran. So that's what Breitbart and Steve Bannon represent, and this was playing out in the administration. And unfortunately, a lot of people on the right didn't see this because they've been. They've been fed this narrative that the deep state is just out in uniform to get Donald Trump, and the bad guys are H.R. McMaster and the people around him, and they're purging the patriots like General Flynn's holdovers. And, of course, um, General Flynn what, General Flynn was the foremost person in the administration, was pushing it from oh, what I think was definitely a very hawkish stance on Iran, which um, it seems to me that I get, the, I get Bush 2001-era vibes from... Uh, from what Michael Flynn coming in two weeks after the uh, inauguration of Trump, less than two weeks, and officially putting Iran on notice. That gives me impressions of the stories we've heard of 
people in the Bush administration were already plotting out an invasion of Iraq and how to go about it within days of George W. Bush's inauguration. Yet this is who has been passed off as a great patriot, Michael Flynn. And then uh, the purging of uh, the Michael Flynn holdovers is a... Uh, or the people loyal to Michael Flynn who shared his views on um, on Islam and on Iran, Iran in particular, I think. That we've heard Mike Cernovich and Carolyn Glick of the Jerusalem Post with um, David Horowitz's Israel Project um, describe as the purging of the of the patriots, of the real fighters of the war on terrorism from within the administration. And a lot of this, I think, and I think Bannon is definitely... Um, Maybe the next domino to fall in this whole regard. And while we keep hearing the narrative that it's because Bannon's domestic policy, the MAGA agenda, is causing all these problems, and um, there's a lot of infighting about that, I really think that there is a foreign policy aspect to this, too. And I think that what we're seeing is, and we've broken this down, is an all-out war breaking out within the foreign policy establishment. And it's between the people who were behind Donald Trump, who pretty much got Donald Trump elected, such as people at Breitbart, represented in the White House by Steve Bannon, and people like General Flynn and people like Sebastian Gorka, among others, and the, and the propagandists within the far right, such as David Horowitz and Pamela Geller, and uh, people like that, Michael Ledeen, who was uh, General Flynn's co-writer, major, major neocon uh, elder, who was one of the biggest advocates of the war in Iraq, and actually as advocating during the war in Iraq that we go right into Iran. People like that, um, they push the hardline Zionist view, the real hardline uh, policy on Israel and Zionism as far as Israel being allowed to build unlimited settlements and ripping up the Iran deal and moving the embassy. And then you've got the other faction, which is epitomized by someone like a General McMaster. And of course, um, and a lot of the people, even within the uh, neo-Khan establishment like Bill Crystal and others, love H.R. McMaster, they support him very much. But um, I think this faction that's represented by McMaster is a faction that is pushing back against these hardline foreign policy of uh, the hardline pro-Israel, anti-Iran uh, policy that is being pushed by, by this other faction. I think that's what's going on here. And it's not like the rest of the establishment isn't supportive of Israel as a Jewish state. Of course they are. But they, I think they're more about maintaining the status quo when it comes to Israel and status quo, bipartisan consensus that has been in place for all these years, thanks to AIPAC and the power of uh, Zionism and the American media and all that, and, and, and in uh, financing and promoting political candidates, the bipartisan consensus has been in place. But I don't think they're down with these uh, hardline settlement policies and um, and other things that are going on. And also the the um, willingness to work with Russia, which um, I'm not going to go in depth to on this show because we've talked about that other times. And we'll talk about that again in the future, I'm sure. So that's what I think is what's going on. There is a major war here. And I think that while you keep hearing about domestic policy, I think foreign policy has a lot to do with this. And, uh, and with the figure like Steve Bannon being put out after General Flynn and after... Uh, some of Flynn's holdovers. So with uh, with Bannon out at Breitbart, I think that this is Bannon's much more powerful at Breitbart than he is in the administration, much more influential. Because Bannon can use the power of Breitbart, if he wanted to, to turn the base against Donald Trump. I really believe that. Um, that this is the guy who can make or break the Trump administration. And what I think it's going to come down to is based on just how much of Trump's policies, uh, policy agenda is actually fulfilled as far as building the wall. And I should say when it comes to things like building the wall that this, this divide on foreign policy also extends into domestic politics. There's a pushback against those who in the Trump administration who want to build the wall, who want to uh, want to get out of NAFTA, who want to, want to like Steve Bannon, who want an economic uh, trade war with China. Um, there's pushback against this too. So you're going to see uh, definitely Steve Bannon is at Breitbart is going to use these issues to uh, is really going to be pushing them hardcore and getting. And I think Bannon at Breitbart is a vitally important back at Breitbart is a vitally important development because more than ever Breitbart's going to shape 
the uh, attitudes of the uh, Trump administration and Trump's base. And but also remember that Bannon's going to be. I think you're going to see an increasing uh, amount of uh, of anti-Iran propaganda on the uh, on on the Breitbart site. Propaganda designed to get get Iran or get us out of the nuclear deal that was in place um, to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And that's one of the things, by the way, that Steve Bannon and the people who praise him forget about is that Steve Bannon was. Uh, was actually officially giving uh, Sheldon Adelson's uh, pol Israel policy, was actually advocating for it in meetings with Trump. So that's one of the things that's missing from this. So I think that, yeah, I think that things are going to get even more chaotic from here on out with, uh, with Steve Bannon back at Breitbart and the war that is come, brewing, coming out and is continuing to evolve and escalate within the... Uh, not just domestic policy, but within the foreign policy establishment. And now you've even had a Sheldon Adelson uh, article just come out saying that he supports H.R. Uh, McMaster being removed as a national security advisor. We'll see where that goes from here, but I believe that's going to be one of Breitbart's biggest, uh, biggest goals now with Bannon back is to see that uh, – that McMaster is indeed removed from his position and then hoping to replace him with someone closer to the views of a Michael Flynn. So uh, we will definitely see what happens with that. And uh, one more thing I'd like to get into real quick, and this is because of the um, because of all that we keep hearing about Charlottesville and anti-Semitism and all this and that, um, is this whole n narrative of what is, of Trump is anti-Semitic, Trump is anti-Jewish, Trump hates Jews, Trump hates Israel, and oh, Trump didn't delayed his response. Trump didn't say or do anything about it, or he wasn't he wasn't efficient enough, or he sided with the right wingers. I think this is part of a very, in some ways, orchestrated strategy to. Um, and I think it goes back in some ways to someone like David Duke uh, saying that voting against Trump is treasonous to your heritage. But it also goes back to Donald Trump tweeting that six-pointed star meme with Hillary Clinton, the most, the most corrupt candidate in history. And may, that may very well have been an accident from Trump. I don't know. But uh, that and then move on a couple months later and just before the election, Trump campaign puts out the ad with George Soros and Janet Yellen and Goldman Sachs and – all the Jewish manipulators of the economy, and it was referred to as an anti-Semitic ad, and then Trump refusing to, uh, omitting Israel from his Holocaust Remembrance, or the Jews, the Jewish people from his Holocaust Remembrance Day statements. And of course it was uh, Trump's good buddy, uh, Ronald Lauder, who he went in front of and actually spoke for the World Jewish Congress in mem commemoration of Israel's, uh, of Israel's Holocaust Remembrance Day. But this narrative that uh, Trump is an anti-Semite and that, or he actually courts anti-Semites and closet anti-Semites, this is, I believe, is very much a manufactured narrative, and I think it actually got the right-wing base, the alt-right, the actual base of the right that is anti-Jewish behind Donald Trump. It got them behind him, and the assets in the media and activism circles, such as David Duke and Richard Spencer, it was a very successful attempt to get their people behind Donald Trump. But once again, this whole thing, is Donald Trump an anti-Semite? Is he, you know, he's not condemning the left. He's, he's not condemning the right. He's condemning the left. He's condemning the people who are protesting white supremacy. I don't believe, this is not what needs to be focused on. And in this, in this, and in this whole thing of what is anti-Semitism, um, we look at the we look at the response of someone like a Benjamin Netanyahu, or his lack thereof response. Where Netanyahu has been raked over the coals in the international media for for not condemning or for not condemning Trump. And he put out a statement three days after condemning you know neo Nazism and white supremacy, but he didn't condemn Donald Trump by name. And even his son put out a Facebook post where he said he's more concerned about the the um the Antifas and the Black Lives Matter, who he says poses a direct threat to his country and to his people. <laughs> so even while the media rants and raves about Trump being an anti-Semite, it's very clear that Trump's got a lot of very powerful uh, support within the 
within the within the Zionist community, particularly the right wing Zionist community, and even overliers like Alan Dershowitz, who are on the left but also have a vi are very much opposed to a lot of more liberal uh, Zionism, liberal Zionism, liberal Judaism, and Dershowitz even takes a more sympathetic tone towards Trump, despite even though he did tell Trump that he needs to disavow uh, the white nationalist base in a recent interview. But it's very clear that uh, Trump is not, that this is not the way to go about looking at this. And actually, in that focusing on Trump, whether or not he's an anti-Semite, whether or not he's courting white nationalists and, uh, and white supremacists and neo-Nazis, is not the way to, to look at this, because I think, once again, this fits into the narrative, the pre the pre-created narrative that has been put in place for us. And this reminds me of the, back in February, just after the election, with the Jewish Community Center bomb threats. And Trump, Trump was not, was criticized, was condemned for not being, um, for not being outspoken enough in condemning the, the, uh, the attacks on Jewish, Jewish uh, community centers, Jewish cemeteries. And Netanyahu was also criticized for not, for not uh, criticizing Trump for his response, and this is a this is a growing pattern with Benjamin Netanyahu, where Netanyahu pretty much defended Trump after during the uproar over the uh, over the Jewish community center vandalism, bomb threats, and cemetery vandalisms, and also the uh, now most recently the the Charlottesville reaction, which he said nothing about that has uh, been critical of Trump in the slightest, um, and then. Uh, Netanyahu refused, the Israeli government refused to condemn um, an anti-George Soros campaign in Hungary, which coincided with Netanyahu's visit uh, earlier this month. So this is, we've got the, the, the battle lines are being drawn, and the, in be making this a debate about anti-Semitism and racism, and it actually moves forward a lot of... Uh, a lot of agendas, and, and Netanyahu is more than willing to allow Donald Trump to uh, to court these uh, court these far right figures because Netanyahu, I think, has more in common with them, and um, and Netanyahu represents an element within Zionism that realizes that these people are needed to uh, to for support in order to continue to perpetuate a right wing Zionist agenda, which they believe is going to. Uh, perpetuate the existence of their precious state of Israel and keep those damned Palestinians from garnering any rights to which they could possibly speak up and say that they demand equality and demand that um, the Israelis stop just killing them at um, killing them in mass and just doing whatever they want to do to them, mowing down the lawn every time they feel the Palestinians are getting a little bit out of line or they're starting to fight back too much. Um, the, the the understanding is that these people are needed, no matter how much they might actually be hostile to Jews in general, or to particularly to liberal Jewish liberal Jews, uh, Jewish liberals. They're needed. Um, they're needed for the support base to ensure that we can get candidates who will push, who will uh, push the hard line and get the voter bases behind those candidates who will support this hard line on Israel, much like a Donald Trump who is never. Um, who, we, despite all we hear about wanting to commit the, create the ultimate peace deal, Donald Trump's sympathies clearly lie with Israel, and not just with Israel, but with the right-wing Israelis. So Netanyahu understands that these people are needed. Steve Bannon and Breitbart understand that these people are needed. Um, Robert Mercer understands that these people are needed. And I think most in the media and political establishment understand that, too, and they understand what's going on. And... Ultimately, the alt-right asset types like David Duke and Richard Spencer are more than willing to promote these uh, to promote these false hopes that are um, that are supported by people like Benjamin Netanyahu and other other examples of hard right-wing Zionism, such as Breitbart and uh, and other websites, World Net Daily, for example. And increasingly info wars. So when we make this about anti-Semitism, I think that this is just a way to uh, play into the hands of 
what's actually happening, just like when we make it about racism. And ultimately, it, this is going to benefit Israel because increasingly people are going to see the struggle of, as we've got, we've got propagandists like Alex Jones out there talking about how all you Israel haters don't understand that Trump and Netanyahu are fighting the same battle. When we get, um, when these people have control of the narrative, and when they're um, equating, in a, and they are equating the struggle of Israel and right-wing Zionists with the struggle of right-wingers in America. And it creates another emotional reaction where no matter what Israel does, no matter how bad people like Donald, people like those around Donald Trump are, no matter how bad Benjamin Netanyahu even is, is that this is the, this is the actual um, better alternative than the solution, which is left-wing chaos and the complete destruction of our heritage and our civilization and and of course, with the left, it works the other way around, whereas uh, this push for more, a more liberal, inclusive Zionism, where we want to keep Israel the way it is, we want to keep Israel as a Jewish state and all that, but we'd like to at least create the perception of equality that, see, we really are treating the Palestinians humanely. We really are giving them their rights. Whereas with, the, with people like Netanyahu and the current government, and those even to the further to the right of him, as well as their... Um, agents in America, such as those those at Breitbart, um, they don't have any. They don't care about equality. They don't care about keeping the facade of equality in place. And so, and so they're just going to continue to push this hard line as they can. And it's the same way with people in America who have no who have no qualms, who who have no like, who don't even who don't even pretend to care about things like uh, actually paying lip service to equality and to democracy and all this stuff. And so so when we're making this about anti-Semitism, we're getting angry about Donald Trump's reaction to bigotry and racism and anti-Semitic uh, sentiments. We're playing into their hands because this is actually, I think, is used to actually, if not benefit Donald Trump himself, to benefit the administration, to benefit um, right-wing movements in general, both in the U.S., throughout the West, and in Israel, because they all pretty much